on time and hello everyone thank you guys for being on time and very flexible with us um we are having a very special event honoring american muslim women and appointed and elected positions uh, my name is lita azim i am the program manager for american invisible and a little bit more about the committee that's put this panel together um, american invisible the muslim public affairs council and the illinois muslim civic coalition create a very special network uh, called the American Muslim Elected Appointed, um, I'm sorry, American Muslim Elected and Appointed Network. It's a dedicated group of folks from across the country representing America at um, the local, state, and county levels. And so today we're honoring Women's History Month. It is March. I think personally we should honor women all the time, but it's okay. We have a month. And so we're highlighting a few amazing women in this space and their journey in public service. So without further ado, I will introduce our panelists. Uh, Samir Farah Khan made history in November of 2020, become the 23rd mayor of Irvine, California. She not only uh, received the highest number of votes for the position of mayor in the city's history, but also shattered glass ceilings as the first woman of color to hold the position and the first Muslim woman to lead a, a large city in the United States. Um, next, we have Nadi Hassan, um, who is a California girl as well. So we have three actually California girls on this panel. So I feel very comfortable. And she is a daughter of, of a US Marine and is also an executive director of a young, of the Young Leaders um, Institution, which is a youth leadership platform and network connector that empowers youth towards social entrepreneurship and social innovation. And Nadia is currently a Maryland State Commissioner for the Governor's Office of Community Initiatives. So thank you too for so much for being here and being on camera and being on time and dealing with the technical difficulties. Um, but we do have a few questions to know more about you and about your journey, um, and I guess hopefully your passion in public service. Um, so I'll go ahead and start kicking off with the mayor. Uh, what was your path to your public service role? You know, my path was very organic. It was nothing that I intended on doing. I never wanted to be in the forefront. I'm more of like the behind the scenes kind of person. Uh, but I think it was like one thing leading after another. Uh, for me, the, the pivotal moment was when I was working on a local campaign, and this is about 2014, um, and, and we were talking about diversity in leadership. And um, I had mentioned that, yeah, in our city, we didn't have diversity when it came to elected officials, and that that was very important to me. And the response I got was, you know, that Irvine wasn't ready for so much diversity uh, when it came to people in leadership roles and um, also that you know someone with a name like mine was totally unelectable and, and that just you know it, it kind of struck a nerve it's like all right this is 2014 and we shouldn't be having these conversations and i'm talking to people like from within my own party and so uh, this this really was an eye-opener for me like you know if, if we're not pushing those boundaries now what's going to happen in the future and that really was that moment where I was like, you know what, maybe I will run. That's amazing. And it's kind of hard to believe because I feel like urban California is actually pretty diverse. Um, it is very diverse. Yeah. But I think, again, the mindset of people when it comes to leadership is, is they have someone very specific in mind. And usually it's like a white male. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for that. And then Nadia, same question for you. Uh, what was your path to public, your public service role? Yeah, first I want to thank um, all the organizers and the coalitions for inviting me here. I'm so happy, you know, to see so many familiar faces. Um, I bring greetings from Governor Hogan's office, um, and he commends all Muslim women across the country for all the amazing work uh, that you guys are doing. So keep it up and thank you. Um, for me, I mean, let's be real. <laughs> there was no path. It was not intentional for me either. Um, you know, I come from an immigrant household. Both of my parents were immigrants from Lebanon. And, um, you know, as a first generation American, I was pretty much handed my vision for my future. And it didn't include politics and it didn't include public service. I was told to get a good education, marry a doctor, start a family, and then you can do whatever you want after that. So, you know, my parents had their plan. Of course, I had my own plan and then God has his plan and, and here we are. So. But for my journey, it, it's been a long one, I would say. And I believe that, you know, God was preparing me for this journey since maybe I was five years old. The very first day I stepped into my kindergarten classroom, 
um, you know, I didn't speak a word of English at that time. My mom didn't speak any English and she only spoke to me in Arabic. And um, so the kids in my class thought they thought I was either deaf or mute until one day a boy heard me utter two words. Uh, you know, my father came to pick me up from school after, you know, after school. And I said, hi, Baba. And this boy just froze in his tracks. And he started jumping up and down with excitement, chanting, oh my gosh, she talked, she talked, because no one had ever heard me talk before. So needless to say, you know, I was embarrassed. Learned, um, Needless to say, I was embarrassed and I learned early on that I was not like the other kids from Anaheim, California. And I had to figure out and learn how to get along with people that don't talk like me, who don't look like me. And quite frankly, you know, they don't even eat like me. Their lunches, uh, you know, at lunchtime, you know, they would be exchanging and sharing bologna sandwiches and chips and Twinkies. And then I would have kebabs and grape leaves and hummus, you know, and if that wasn't embarrassing enough, then the kids would look at my lunch and say, ooh, what is that? And sadly at the time, I didn't have the vernacular to explain to them what my mom had packed for me in my lunch. But little did I know that at that time, my elementary school environment, recess time, lunch time, was nothing more than a microcosm of the social and political environments in which we live today. And it was those experiences, I believe, that actually prepared me for the work that I'm doing in public service now, which is, you know, to, to foster public-private partnerships across the state of Maryland and to promote diversity, just much like, you know, to, to fair point to promote uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and advance that multicultural understanding among uh, diverse populations. And so as a young girl, I may not have had the language nor the skills to effectively navigate a space where I was being othered. But from that experience, I gleaned a mindset and an elevated consciousness that enabled me to build empathy and compassion for people and a love for public service. No, that's, that's great. And I think you hit it right on the nail, like you talking about bringing your own culture's food. I remember being teased bringing like the, like, you know, the kebabs are like rolled up and it's like brown. People were like, oh, you eating poo? And I'm like, oh, I don't even know how to explain this. Right. And it's also just like our parents, at least my parents, I feel like it was very much like stay in your lane under the radar, like don't cause any trouble, like it's fine, which I think, um, Kind of, I, I understand where they're coming from, but I do think it, it affects us, especially as women, when we go into these type of positions and these roles, uh, where you kind of have to like break the barriers a little bit, have those tough conversations and, and be comfortable with that. Um, but you also mentioned some obstacles, which is actually the next question we want to ask, which is where, what were some obstacles that you faced as a woman on this journey into public service? Is that for me or? Yes, we'll start with you. Sorry. Okay. Well, my goodness, obstacles, where do I begin? Um, I think post 9-11, um, the obstacles have been raining down on Muslims everywhere. So there's no escaping that. But specifically, I would say for Muslim women in the United States, you know, we bore the brunt of many of those obstacles and challenges because we became the forefront, the, the frontline targets within our community due to just our overt disability. And literally, uh, I remember on September 12th, you know, Muslim women were being harassed in public. And many of them had their scars pulled off. Um, young Muslim girls were being bullied in schools. And overnight, we had to become subject matter experts on all things Muslim related. And we had to under understand how to respond um, to accusations of, of terrorism and what does jihad in Islam mean? I mean, things that, you know, we never, con issues that we never contemplated before. And, you know, we were literally bombarded night and day with fear mongering tactics of the media and various political pundits, um, you know, were saying the most heinous things about, about Muslims. And, but, we, but we were the ones who were visible, you know, very visible in the public. And we had to figure out how to respond to all these um, Islamophobic, uh, Islamophobic attacks and the various microaggressions that kept coming at us by everyone and anyone who was glued to Fox News at the time. But this came full circle for me. And I think the greatest obstacle presented itself in 2011 
when I was faced with a life altering fight or flight encounter with my own city councilwoman. And she was a member of the Tea Party. Her name was Deborah Polly. And I don't know if Salam al Mariotti is, uh, is on the line, but you know, he, he's, he, he got, you know, I, I pulled the impact in to, to help with the situation, but she made a harrowing hate speech against the Muslim community, one that went viral, where she threatened to kill Muslims uh, via her U.S. Marine son and all of his cronies who were also enlisted in the Marines. And so this was a spine chilling, awe numbing experience because for the first time in my life, I didn't feel safe in my own childhood hometown of Villa Park. And I felt like my country, my city, and the only home I've ever known was being hijacked. And my faith was being hijacked right along with it, you know? And so this was even more so disturbing for me because, you know, I am the daughter of U.S. Marine and for most of my life, the Marines were a source of inspiration. I remember all of the stories that my father used to tell us about the great experiences of the Marines and how it made a man out of him. And, and now, you know, my councilwoman through her threats have made this a very, you know, a threatening, um, it became a threatening risk for me in my life and for my community. And I couldn't understand why this woman who's supposed to represent me is now hurling attacks against me, my faith, my community. And so I ran the gamut of emotions from fear to hate to anger and back to fear again. And all I could wonder about was who's going to save us from the Tea Party and, and all of their attacks that they're planning and then one morning I woke up and I realized that that who had to be me. And so I started talking with neighbors and reaching out to many of the Muslim families in Villa Park. And I spent my days and nights emailing and raising awareness. I reached out to the mosques, the Muslim organizations, MPAC Care, the Shura Council. I called a meeting and surprisingly, a lot of people came and showed up and they were concerned. It wasn't just the Muslims who were concerned, but I found that there were a lot of um, other civic organizations and interfaith organizations who were you, who were ready to stand with us in solidarity. And so from there, we organized a large protest outside of City Hall, got a lot of media attention. And from that point, point you know, the outpouring of support just kept coming in from the from the broader um, community. And it was then that, you know, I birthed the Villa Park Peace Coalition and it became a platform to counteract hate and push back against uh, Deborah Polly and all of her friends' anti-hate agenda. And within two years time, uh, she was asked to step down from the Orange County uh, GOP. She was the first, I, I believe she was the first chair, that was her, her position, um, because she was bringing too much embarrassment to the Republican party. And thanks to our or organizing efforts, she then, um, she then uh, proceeded to run for OC supervisor. I think she was running against Spitzer at the time and she lost that race. And um, um, and her per political career began to plummet thereafter. But um, yeah, so that's that was a huge obstacle <laughs> for me that you know taught me a lot of great lessons in life and allowed me to further my my um, my activism. No, it's super inspiring, and and um, I guess disclaimer is like Nadia, someone who actually went through American Visible Public Leaders for Inclusion Council. And this is a story that she shared with me before. And especially at that time, that year, I feel like that's just so inspiring. And I, it does take a lot out of the person to be able to rally the troops and be able to be comfortable in your identity and like be confident and be like, hey, like, no, like, this is not right. And I'm going to be the person to push this. And I'm going, and on top of that, coalition building. You're able to reach out to your neighbors. You're able to reach out to different organizations that are there to help you. And I think that's kind of the beauty of, to be dramatic, of America, right? In a sense, that there's so many resources and there's so many people who are willing to help. And I think that's, that's this is kind of the next question too, but like, I do think it's an obstacle, but it's also very empowering. So thank you for sharing that with us. And, and thank, you're welcome. And I would be remiss to say, I think Farah was part of that too. I, I remember she <laughs> was around and, and she attended some of the meetings and I, I don't remember the specifics, but you know, this was pre her getting into office, but, but she was definitely, and, and Orange County at the time was very red, a very conservative. And I think there was a, a way, you know, after that, you know, there was a wave of, you know, a blue wave that, that came, you know, so yeah, but yeah. thank you Sarah, for, for also participating. 
Uh, Fair, before I, I pass it off to you, I do want to add some context. Um, I think there's a general idea that California is actually very progressive and the whole state is progressive, but in reality, there's definitely pockets of conservatism, which is totally fine, but as any other state, California does have um, their red districts. And I will say Orange County, I think, carries a lot of it. And Tavera, like if you wanted to touch on this story and if, please share your own obstacles that you've experienced outside of this experience, that'd be great. Absolutely. You know, um, it, it's, I think for me personally, it's easier when I know that it's my opposition that's attacking me, right? Because you know how to handle it. I think in politics, some of the hardest moments are when you uh, encounter people that you would consider your allies to be attacking you. That's when you're like, wait a minute, I thought we were all for the environment. I thought we were all, we were all for women's rights. Uh, but yet when it comes to being Muslim, th there's, a, there's a, a hard line that some people will not cross. And uh, that's really difficult. So, you know, um, having people uh, call out during my first campaign was in 2016, I was running for city council. Um, having people call out and have these signs uh, that were put up throughout town saying that I was uh, a member of CARE. And for me, that was like, oh, okay, so what's so wrong about that? But it was like, you know, linking it to uh, Islamic militar um, militarism and um, uh, extremism and things like that. And uh, at that time, again, the coalition building that we were doing in different areas with Nadia and Villa Park and me and Irvine, having those people, especially from the faith communities, step up. Um, I had a letter that went out from multiple rabbis, imams, uh, pastors, uh, that countered that hate. And they were basically stating that, hey, we know her, we know who she is. Um, all these banners that we're seeing across town do not represent uh, Fada, and uh, we know who she really is. And so, you know, uh, there's always a, a balance um, and it comes from doing the work. If you don't have the groundwork done, if you don't build those relationships, um, in times like that, you will find yourself in isolation. And thankfully, um, I had those relationships where um, it took one phone call to say, hey, did you guys see these banners out there? And, and they stepped it up and, and responded. But it's a continuing uh, barrier. It's not just, you know, you deal with it one time and you move on. It happens in microaggressions. It happens in closed doors. It happens openly. And, you know, when uh, I became mayor in 2020, uh, you know, having people come up and say that I wasn't strong enough, that I needed to rely on my colleagues or that I should confer with them, um, that I didn't have the leadership skills when in fact, you know, I knew I did. Uh, so it's, they create this um, self-doubt in you that you're not good enough. And, and so uh, along with that, you know, those are like the little microaggressions of kind of bringing you down, like trying to tear you down as much as possible. Um, but then, then there's ones where, you know, we had a group of white supremacists that came out um, just uh, a few months ago and had banners hanging from our freeways targeting me for being a Muslim mayor. And, uh, you know, there was a video that came out, um, these three guys in masks sitting there, and, you know, they're so afraid they're wearing masks, so they can't even show their own faces uh, to, to proclaim that this is who we are. But um, they wear these masks and basically um, they were saying, oh yeah, you know, there's a Muslim mayor in Irvine and we wanna go back there because it's a lot of fun to go back and attack her. And, um, you know, that's when we had like this, the local, the state and federal um, investigators involved because, you know, when you're dealing with white supremacists that are not even from your own town or your area, you don't know what they're capable of doing. We've seen the horrific stories uh, on the news. And for me, my biggest issue was protecting my family. I'm like, you know, the message that went out was, you know, I'm ready to tackle the issue. I am ready to face whatever it is that needs to be faced, but there is no way that anyone is gonna target my family. Um, and so, you know, there are times when you just gotta put that thick skin on and, and, and move forward. And for me, the message wasn't like, oh, I'm gonna cower, I'm gonna be scared. It was like, you know what? I'm gonna be at that overpass the next time you come out. What are you gonna do then? Mm -hmm. And they didn't show up. And so, you know, uh, sometimes you really, uh, I see a lot of times uh, people will be like, you know, don't, even our local police said, you know, don't counter them, don't respond to them. And I said, fine, you know what, on social media, I will not respond. I'll just make one statement. Next time you come out on the overpass, I will find you there. And that was really what I meant. 
Like, I'm not going to hide in my home. I'm not going to hide in my office. I want to see you and I want to see your faces. If you have the gall to come out here and make these statements to target me, to target my community, you better be able to do it to my face. And I think sometimes this is what they need to see. They, they are cowards. That's who they are because they hide behind masks. They hide behind social media, but they are not willing to come up front. And um, I don't recommend this for everyone. Um, just know that I do have protection with me. But for me, that was really important. It was like, I am drawing the line here. We're not, we're not going to go there. We're not going to do this any further. Um, and, and thankfully, thank God, uh, they haven't been back. Um, but again, it, you just never know. It's, it's one day after another. I mean, I get emails all the time, every day, um, telling me that I'm bringing um, my Islamic values to the city council. And I'm just like, where? <laughs> right. Like, you know, you want to give me some details? Uh, the most funniest one was I do a monthly newsletter sharing what's going on in the city. And it was um, Lunar New Year. So I had written um, Happy Lunar New Year in like Chinese, Vietnamese, Korean, and I think Japanese and um, in the newsletter. And I got this really angry all caps email saying that they did not want to hear my Islamic language in my newsletters. And I said, explain to me where you see Islamic language in my newsletter. And then they copied and pasted. And I said, it says Happy New Year in these four different languages. Like, go get yourself an education. Right. And after that, they were like, how dare you tell me to get an education? So it moved on from like, you know, targeting me to like, how dare I say this? But, you know, sometimes you just get fed up. And, and for me, I'm that kind of person. Like I grew up in a household where my dad was like, if someone's picking on you, you better get out there and fight. And we were three girls um, growing up. So um, for me, it's never been an issue. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. And, um, you know, I, I thank my dad, um, you know, he never got to see me uh, be mayor, but I think he would be very proud um, because he was the one that would push me. He would be like, you know, you don't take, you, I'm not gonna say it, but you don't take shit from anyone. <clears throat> like, you know, be a strong woman. Be a, and at that time he used to tell me, be a strong girl. Go out there and do what you need to do. And then just know that I'm here behind you. And that was what important for him, letting me know that he was gonna be behind me all the way. And I think that's what's important when we talk about women in public office or women that are um, trying to get into the public field is that they need other women behind them saying, I got your back. And that's what's important, because I know I had a lot of women um, on my back as I went through my journey. And um, anytime I meet someone, I always tell them, if you need me, just know I'm here because uh, we, we do need that. We can't be as bold and strong as we want to be, not knowing if you know, we turn around that there's nobody, nobody there. And so um, it, it's really important to have that network of, of strong support. Absolutely, yeah. And I echo everything that Farah said, and I, I totally can, could um, relate to, to, to your story and your journey, because I too had, uh, you know, my father empowered me with all of those great things. And, you know, and it, and it comes down, you know, when people are attacking you, you know, they're, they're trying to, you know, they, they want you to go away. They yeah. want you to hide. They don't want you to come out. And, you know, you're really faced with a choice at that point. I mean, you can either, you know, you can fight or you can flight. And mm -hmm. those are the choices that you're faced with. And, you know, you know, when you're a, a lot of times, you know, school or life doesn't really prepare you a lot of times for these. It's like, it just happens. And like on the moment, you have to make those decisions and you don't even know yourself what decision you're going to make. It's, it's, it's either you rise to the occasion or you, you know, you hide. And we, you know, we've seen this. I mean, this has been, when we talk about obstacles, this has been a big obstacle and, you know, very, and, and challenge, it challenged us after post 9-11 because it was continual attacks against our community and we had to continue continually you know muster up the strength to be able to stand up and punch that bully in the nose in the snow and say no you're not going to take us over you're not going to bring us down we are going to stand our ground we are going to say what we have to say and I love what you said Farah about you know you know, just, just letting them know I'm going to show up. And that's really half the battle is showing up and being there. And I remember when I was organizing in Villa Park, um, a lot of times I felt isolated. I did. I felt alone. I felt like, 
you know, not enough people. Um, I didn't have enough support, but oftentimes it's not the number of people, but it's the quality of right. people. Sometimes just a couple of really good so people, you know, supporters who have your back is enough to overcome the greatest challenges and the greatest obstacles. So, um, yeah, I, you know, I share, share all of that with you. So thank you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you both for all that you do, because I definitely got chills and listening to both of y'all's answers and it's empowering and it's inspiring. And I think what's great is when you show up, it's, you kind of humanize yourself, which is like bad to say, but I think sometimes the oppressor don't, doesn't look at us as humans at whatever, whatever level you want to look at it. And I think, you know, responding and engaging and whatever way that is, like, I think actually humanizes us. And it's like, okay, actually there is a person on the other side of this that lives in the same city that I live in, right? Or like, you know, our schools, our children go to the same schools. And so um, I think that's a really great point. And I think what's even awesome is that like, far you're from the Bay Area, I'm from the Bay Area. And like my dad also um, has two daughters and he's always been, I guess, the pusher to make sure that we're independent and that we can stand our own two feet and make sure that um, no one can bully us as Nadia has mentioned about his, her own father. So um, a strong household definitely goes a long way. Um, so to transition a little bit, I think we kind of covered this a little bit, but I would, I think everyone here, including myself, would love to hear from the both of you about some empowering moments y'all have had throughout your career, whether that's before becoming mayor, before commissioner, or even like on the path. So um, it can be a couple of examples, whatever you like. Um, I think some of y'all have mentioned it too, but we'd love to hear uh, more about it. So uh, Faria, I'll go ahead and hand it off to you. All right, so um, let's see. I think one was um, when I lost my first campaign in 2016, because I didn't win um, that year. I won in uh, 2018. And um, I had gone through this training program for women called Emerge. And um, after I'd lost, I, I just felt like I was beat up. Politics was so ugly. And, you know, you're drained because you're just, you know, 24 seven uh, campaigning, trying to get the word out and you're getting beat up on a constant basis. So when it's all over, you're just like, I, don't, I just wanna close the door. I don't wanna deal with anyone. Uh, and for me really, um, like many people would think, I was like, you know what, This maybe this isn't for me. And um, it, I got a call from the executive director of Emerge, Kimberly Ellis at the time, an amazing, amazing woman. Um, and, and so she reached out and, and she was like, hey, how are you doing? And I'm like, oh, you know, I feel kind of bad. I didn't win. And she's like, yeah, but you did really well. You came in fourth as a first time candidate out of 11 candidates. Um, so when are you opening your next committee? And I started laughing. I'm like, are you kidding me? I mean, I'm like, I'm done. I, I, this is it. This was horrible. I didn't like the experience. Um, I cried most of the campaign. Um, and so I'm like, I, I don't think so. And she's like, oh, no, no, sweetie. You know what? We go through these emotions. You're going to go through these emotions. But you need to let me know when you open your next committee uh, because you're running in 2018. And for me, it was like, wait, you're telling me that I'm going to run again and I'm not even there yet. And she's like, oh, no, I know you are. And I have to say, if I didn't get that phone call and I, if I didn't have that conversation, maybe I wouldn't have run in 2018 and I wouldn't have been a first out of 12 candidates running and I wouldn't be mayor today. Um, and so it goes back to that having that network of people that are going to support you, not only to celebrate you in the good times, but be there in, in the bad times, be there when you're down uh, and be able to lift you up. Uh, and then the second one is um, when I was um, mayor, uh, I was going to a school, I think it's like a dare graduation. And um, this little girl came up to me and um, she was like, can I take a picture with you? And I'm like, of course you can. And um, she goes, do you know why I just love you? And I'm like, no, tell me. And she goes, because you look like me and we have the same last name. That was just, oh my gosh, I was like in tears right there. And I was like, you know what? This is why we do what we do. This is why we fight every day and we, and we become the target for so many people because that girl now sees a leader a mayor and she can go beyond that and do so much more because it's inspiring her like i see someone that looks like me and we share the same last name how cool is that 
And you never think of that, you know, in your daily life of how many people you're affecting, especially the young ones that are out there. Because growing up, I didn't have role models, right? I mean, I, who do we look at? And so um, for them to have that is so important. And so I, I really think that um, women that are uh, into policy or public office uh, or politics really need to come out of their comfort zone and go out there and achieve those goals because there's a whole generation of girls looking up to find that person that will inspire them. And, and we've got to be the ones to open those doors. So those are my two stories that I, that I like. No, definitely. And I think um, just hearing a story of that little girl just being like, you look like me and we have the same name, like that's, that's crazy. Like that warms yeah. my heart as well. It's like, I don't know, it's, representation really does go a long way. Oh, hello. <laughs> um, it really does go a long way. And I think moments like that, like as you mentioned, just brings it all together. And I think for me, like in this space, like moments like this, actually like this panel and bringing everyone together is like what inspires me. I'm like, this is why I do what I do. So I can, I totally get it. Uh, Nadia, are you up next? Yep, yep, yep. So gosh, in terms of empowering moments, I would say there's been many, but um, just living in Orange County, California, growing up there, um, I had the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of many giants. Um, I was fortunate to grow up under the leadership of many great Muslim leaders like Drs. Hassan and Maher Hatou, Dr. Ahmed Saqqar, Allah Hamhom, and Dr. Muzamal Siddiqui, Dr. Rachel Dusuki. There were many uh, imams and leaders in our community who you know, had a really great impact on my life. And I think the person who probably had the greatest impact on my life was the greatest athlete of all time, uh, Muhammad Ali, who was a very close friend uh, to my father and my uncles. Uh, my uncle was on staff with him. And so being in his presence um, is really, was really a, um, an experience um, it, it just being in his presence alone was an experience, was a learning experience, his love, his compassion, his generosity. Um, and, you know, as I reflect and think about my journey, I oftentimes draw a lot of lessons and, and, and experiences from just being around him, being able to grow up around him. Um, but just in general, each of the leaders that I they mentioned, you know, they were all revolutionary change makers in their own right, and they taught us and trained and inspired and motivated us to reach our greatest potential. But where I think um, the inflection point was for me was when I began actively modeling the behaviors of my teachers and those role models. And I finally realized that despite any language barriers that I may have had, had you know, during my early childhood uh, years and any speech impediments, I realized that I have a voice and my voice matters. And I can use my voice to make a difference in people's lives and that I don't have to wait for anyone to speak for me, to speak for me or to help me fight against systemic oppression. And I, it, it was through that experience that I gained the courage to speak truth to power. And I was able to do that for myself and for my community for the many years, you know, while we were under attack um, by the Islamophobes. And so, I would definitely say that that experience was an empowering moment that gave me the courage to start my own nonprofit organization called the Young Leaders Institute. And so that I can open to, to Farah's point about opening doors, you know, I wanted to be able to help others. Um, you know, I wanted to open the doors for others and pass that leadership baton to an entire new generation of young leaders, just as those who came before me did for me. And so, um, you know, I was fortunate to have mentors and, and, and great leadership in my life, but another empowering moment I would say is when I was able to see that when, when I was able to recognize that my own vulnerabilities, when I was able to share my vulnerabilities with, with young people and show them 
that they too have the power to be something amazing, to be able to dream beyond their wildest dreams, to be able to do things, to gain leadership skills that will enable them to become great leaders in their future. When I was able to see that in action, that, that changed my life and, 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 and it, it, it made me, um, or, or I'll, I'll speak about one young girl in particular who attended my leadership trainings and she was from Massachusetts and she had never met a Muslim before coming to, she came down to DC, she spent a summer and she had never known any Muslims. And so she came to, I don't know how she found out about my trainings, but she came to my trainings and she started meeting other young Muslims and the impact on her life, you know, after going to the mosque and seeing, you know, how Muslims prayer, pray and understanding the lifestyle and, you know, the, the, the cultural habits, she was, she really became interested in Islam. And I watched her transform her dress from one that was not very modest to one that was more modest. And I saw her, even her behaviors change. And she later um, joined the Young Leaders Institute to be uh, to take on a one year long uh, internship and went on to 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 do amazing things in her life. And so when I see young people um, rising in their leadership skills and 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 trying to and striving for for um, a higher potential, it just it it makes it gives me joy in my heart. Um, there was another young girl. One of the things that I, that I want to talk about is also that I've noticed among young people is that when they're coming out of high school, they really don't have a strong direction for what they want to do for their lives. They're really not sure about what they want to study or what area they want to go in. And so I, I found that when they come through the trainings, they have a better idea. They're able to, to, um, to hone in on their passion and what they may want to do in their future. So there was this one girl after I had taken a group of youth to the Hill to meet with their legislators, they've never, these kids had never met with a Senator or a, or a Congress member before. And after that experience, this young girl decided to change her major, um, decided to, to study uh, political science in college. And she uh, decided that she wanted to, to go into public office. That was her, that was her path. And so these were very empowering moments for me. And so you know, I, I tell my kids all the time that when someone opens a door for you, it becomes imperative that you reach back and pull the next person through. And um, I recently heard uh, Kamala Harris talk about this when she at the White House uh, for Women's History Month, uh, when she was talking about her mother, and she was tell she was telling us that her mother used to say, "Kamala, you may be the first person to do many things, but make sure you're not the last. And so I thought that that quote beautifully demonstrated that point. And I'm truly grateful to all of my teachers and role models who had opened doors for me, and which is why I'm paying it forward through the work that I'm doing at the governor's office and through my nonprofit organization to uplift youth, liter youth leadership. So. Absolutely amazing. I think I wanted to touch on two points, like you mentioned, sharing your story and just sharing your experience. Like I cannot emphasize enough, like sharing your own public narrative. And like my parents are from Afghanistan. That's something I've been trying to do in my community. It's like, it's important for us to take a step back and recognize our story and recognize how we've come to our place and to like our space and be able to share that with everyone else. It's like learning that like vocabulary, for example, learning, what does this mean in the ground, grander uh, scheme of things? And so um, I think that's really important. And then two, you mentioned starting your own um, nonprofit and the Institute, which is absolutely amazing. Um, and having those moments where like you see your work actually become kind of like a tangible thing. Cause usually this type of work isn't tangible. And so for us, like a nonprofit that I started um, outside is we actually did like a voter guide in California and we were able to translate that, first of all, condense it and kind of just use day-to-day -day language and then translate it into like two very commonly used language in Afghanistan. So that way our seniors can actually be able to vote and understand what they're voting on. And so like, you know, our, our community members are taking videos of their parents or their grandparents like voting and using this guide and like, I cried. Like, I'm not an emotional person, trust me. But like, I was like, up because like, this is like, 
what we've been trying to do and like, you know, community organizing and public service and all honesty is not fun, right? It's very challenging, but it can be very rewarding and these moments make it very rewarding. So uh, thank you both for sharing those moments. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left um, and I do wanna close off on even like a higher note and something that our audience can take away, which is who are some women that y'all look up to? And they can be someone you've looked up to when you're younger, like, you know, during this journey or even now. And I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to think about that. Um, and either one of y'all can, can take over. I know I get asked this question a lot. And honestly, I don't think there is any particular woman that I, I look up to, but I think there are characteristics of many different women um, that, that I enjoy. And, and I think that's important too. A, a lot of times um, we, and I know um, I, I do it too, but we, we tend to kind of idolize someone, um, you know, and think that they're perfect. And, and really we're not, uh, we all have our flaws, we all make mistakes. And um, I, I always tend to think that it, the qualities that stand out in certain people um, th that really kind of uh, help me get to where I am. And, and one of the stories, I'll share just one, uh, which is uh, I've always been at odds with uh, then Congresswoman Loretta Sanchez. Um, politically, she and I did not see eye to eye, um, but uh, there was a quality in her that um, even though we didn't, when she saw that I was being attacked, she reached out and was like, listen, I've been through this. I know what you're going through, let's talk. And for me, I was like, oh wait, like, you know, I, I, I called out on some policies that you've had and didn't like them and was very vocal about them. But she's like, yeah, that's politics, that's different. But as women to women, we've got to talk. I need to be there for you. And she was like, you know, she showed up at a Pakistani event wearing a shalwar kameez um, and, and showed up to, to support me. And so it's, it's, it's those things that really stand out. It's like you look for the women that, that are there for you when you're going through your hardest time. And, and you think, OK, like what, what got her to take action at that moment? And where am I when I see something like this happening? Where am I in these other women's lives? Am I picking up that phone and reaching out to them? Uh, am I being there beside them? Am I you know, just there for their support? And I think that's really what it is. It's, it's little things from different women throughout history um, that really speak out and, and, and kind of help you become a better woman yourself. And I think that's really what's important. Yeah, absolutely. That's I, I love that example. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't have said it myself uh, better myself. Thank you, Farah, for that. Um, you know, I mean, there there are definitely, you know, to, to Farah's point, you know, there is definitely no shortage of you know, female role models um, that I looked up to. There's many, I mean, Malala Yusuf, Yousafzai, Tawakul Carmen, Oprah Winfrey, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Maya Angelou, Michelle Obama, Kamala Harris, Greta Thunberg, Harriet Tubman. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. But I think where I get my energy from and where I glean so much inspiration, um, very similarly to what, to what Farah was saying is, from the many unsung role models, heroes and sheroes, um, whose names may never be known to the entire world, but those, you know, those role models live among us and they inspire us to be better human beings on a daily basis. And, um, you know, through my, my leadership work, um, you know, I, 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 I've come to learn that everybody um, is a role model in one way or another. Everyone has, strengths and and great leadership qualities and it's just you know it's just we need to open our eyes and we need to recognize those strengths and those those good qualities in the people and and you know acknowledge and recognize them um and you know and if and if i want to bring faith into into the conversation for just a second you know wasn't that the prophetic model of leadership of our prophet beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him i mean wasn't that what the prophet did when, you know, when he was with his companions, he used to acknowledge and recognize and highlight the leadership qualities and the good characteristics that each of his companions had. And then 
He would even de delineate roles for each of them based on their strengths and their great qualities. And so um, I think, um, you know, a lot of times we may not agree with somebody and we kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and forget that, yeah, there might be something that we may not like about an individual, but then why are we focusing on the negative? Why are we not looking at the positive things that we could glean and learn from that person? And, you know, there's no per there's nobody who's perfect. Um, you know, I'm not perfect and, and I don't think there's anybody uh, on this planet who is. And so if we were to just focus our energies and recognize the good qualities um, in people, I think we would, you know, we would have much more harmonious relationships in our community and our society and we'd be able to work together and build more relationships and be able to do more um, together. So so yeah, I, I believe that there there are a lot of um, you know within our inner circles people, the people who are within our inner circles it probably impact our lives much more than those who we don't actually have access to. so. No, really well said. I think um, not that this is the only takeaway, but I think a very strong takeaway is that everyone has the potential to be a role model or a leader. And I think that's really important. And both of y'all have shared moments where someone believed in you and was able to instill that confidence and that motivation to do what you want to do. And I think that's really important. And that's something I can definitely relate to. So thank you both for sharing that. Uh, we are close to time, so um, I do want to give both of you guys an opportunity to share any closing remarks um, before we go ahead and tie this up. And if you don't, that's totally fine too. So I'm just going to leave it out there for like 10 seconds. No, I just want to thank all of you um, for bringing this on and, and hosting this uh, wonderful discussion. Um, thank you for everything that you do. Absolutely. And I echo Farah. I think, you know, MPAC and America Indivisible, who I very much enjoyed joining the, the PLC group. And I encourage anybody who is holding public office to join in this program because it's a fabulous program. Um, kudos to 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 you all to Lita for you know for leading the um, you know the 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 the, the sessions and everything. It was great. Um, and, and, you know, I just want to acknowledge all the great leaders that are on this, um, on this call, uh, or on this zoom panel, um, each one, you know, I was looking through the list of who's there. I mean, all of you are doing amazing things, um, in our world, in our society. And, um, we can't do what we do without you. Um, we are only doing, we are only able to be successful in our roles um, with the support of, of, of all of your leadership. So I just want to thank, you know, all of you, and like I said, America Indivisible, MPAC, and um, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Um, thank you. Thank you, Farah. Thank you, Lita. And thank you to all who are, who are here today. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I think Alara has her hands up. Let me just, uh, let me just make sure. All right, Delara, you're on. Asalaamu Alaikum. Could, this is not Delara. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. This this is Sadia Covert. <laughs> oh, surprise! Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm so sorry. I could not join you guys today. Um, but I do. Uh, you know, would like to be on the panel for the next event and I just wanted to I know I don't know why I'm a panelist on this link <laughs> um I, I'm not sure if you guys could see me or not um unfortunately we can't but we can definitely hear you okay okay great no no I just wanted uh to um congratulate everybody and thank all our elected officials um you know Farah, Nadia, Lida and, and Delara thank you so much for hosting this event um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to make it today, but I do look forward uh, to your next event um, where I could fully participate. Um, <clears throat> just want to let everybody know uh, it's just been really um, crazy. I have three kids <laughs> and a law practice and county board and a lot of stuff. So, um, but I, I really do appreciate this seminar and, um, you know, just sending good vibes to all the women out there and happy uh, Women's Month. So thank you for doing this. Kudos no to worries. you. Kudos to yes. you. 
(laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. And for all those um, who are listening, I am um, the elected DuPage County Board uh, Commissioner in District 5, which is Lyle, Naperville, and Aurora. And we've been doing a lot of uh, great work out here. Um, I was elected in 2018, back on the ballot for re-election in 2022. So, um, and I encourage, um, you know, the women in our community, we have so many talented women and I encourage them to run for office and be involved. Um, They have valuable input and experience. And I'm just really proud to see more women in this field. Awesome. Thank you so much, Arya, for taking the time. Uh, No worries whatsoever. I know we all have a lot of our plate and it means a lot for you to even check in, um, even for a little bit. So thank you. It was really good hearing from you and we will definitely reach out to you for the next panel for sure. This is a recorded uh, video, so we have it on record. Of course. Um, Anyways, uh, thank you everyone for joining. This was such a great hour. Uh, Thank you to our panelists. I am personally inspired. I am going to run for city council of Milpitas. Just kidding, but I will definitely see what happens in the future. But thank you again so much. It was so good hearing from each and every one of you. Uh, Everyone have a great day, have a great week, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.